ready or not. Here I come, you can't hide. Gonna find you and take it slowly. A Hot 97 production presents Thomas, Fuji's, The Score. And now for our future presentation. Yo. What's Let's up? first start, start off by just introducing yourself and uh, who you are. That feels so funny. I know, right? <laughs> it was 1995, and I was doing, I was the director of A&R for Raucous Entertainment. Well, um, at the time, Prize was always the businessman. Go down there, get everything going. Uh, me and Clef was always in a basement with Miss Hill, and of course, and I, w I was the chopper. I was chopping samples and chopping up drums, the loop, and bass lines, and just creating. It's like we telling Flex, He's like, yo, Salon, what you doing this week? You know, I'm working with the Fuji's. Ah, oh, Padoof, Bob, oh my gosh. I was 19, 20 years old, and, uh, and all my life I thought that I would be the performer, I would be the artist, but here I was, I was doing a and I was finding uh, underground talent, I was going back home, I was speaking to Population Click, I was speaking to Talib Kweli, Mos Def, trying to, trying to get brothers that I knew. Hey man, come on up from Washington Square Park days. Um, to, uh, to, to let, let's maybe pursue this independent route. And it was then, when I was doing A&R, ironically enough, that I went to a Fuji show. My friend Jeff Burroughs, who was working at Columbia at the time, um, came, into, came into this office one day, and he said, I've got the future of music in my hands. And he had a video cassette tape, VHS, and he popped it in, and it was a black and white video, two guys and a girl, and the song was Boof Bath. And I thought to myself, man, this is weird but I like it. The flop of Booth Boff kind of generated even more energy and wasn't in a position to where you was gonna let anything lose at that moment. So it was almost like, clearly, Lauren was the star and it was very, very visible. Clef was like the genius when it came to musicianships and everything like that. And when you look at Prize, he was more like a businessman. So I think they all played their specific roles within the refugee camp. And the group dynamic was Clef would try anything. Lauren would debate you. Clef would be like, let's just try it and see what it is. And Prahas would be kind of in and out, but saying, yo, I think this works. And then when you see the debate going on, he just disappeared and come back like, yo, this is what I want to do. Oh, you want to do it? You want me to do it yet? All right, I'll be right back. <laughs> and I remember walking into the supper club and I saw these instruments on the stage. And I said to the bouncer, you know, I'm at, no, I'm at the wrong show. And he said, why are you at the wrong show? I said, I'm here for a hip hop show. He said, why? I said, there's no instruments in it. I see instruments on stage. I'm here for a hip hop show. I should see a DJ. And he said, no, no, I, I think you're going to be in for it. You know, these, these guys actually play instruments. So I was already intrigued because I didn't see that from Booth Bath. But I walked in and I'm like, I see a guitar and a bass and keyboards and a drum riser. And, a, and I was I was seduced immediately. And so my involvement with the score, I guess, started a couple years before because I remixed uh, Nappy Heads, and then also did a remix on Vocab, their singles off of their first album, and kind of helped get them in the pocket. And then ended up doing Fujila um, in some sessions really before the score got started. And then with Fujila, you know, that ended up being kind of like the blueprint for the score for my vision. We used to be number ten, now we permanent in one in the battle. Of my dad gave me and my brother White Clef the basement, and I remember Prize family move, uh, you know, decide to move to Florida, and Prize just moved to the to my dad's house in the basement. And, but the basement was the place where everyone we create a a movie. Like if you rap, you sing, you want, especially if you rap, you need to be in the basement. When they got the opportunity to do a second album. That was because Salam did the remix for Nappy Heads. They were very close to getting dropped, they being the Fugees, they were very close to getting dropped. But then the Nappy Heads remix came out. And I remember when Lauren called me, she called me and they were on the road and she said, the Nappy Head remix uh, is, is doing well. Sony wants us to do one more album. And I was like, congratulations, that's great. And she said, I think you should contribute something to that album. And I'm like, what? No, I don't, I don't produce, I don't rap, I'm, I'm an executive, I'm a businessman. And she was like, yeah, whatever, dude. I think you need to come out to the Booger Basement and, and play us some joints. Hanging out in the Booger Basement was one of those moments where, and then I was a hardhead little, I didn't, I didn't even know where my life was going at that time. I would show up to the studio in stolen cars 
Clef be all paranoid trying to get me out of there before the cops come <laughs> busting through the door. <laughs> um, but, you know, between Jerry Wonder and myself, Spider, uh, Prize, Clef, Lauren, of course, you know, that energy in that studio, just from the sense of just that family and all of us being foreigners and refugees in our own light in America, feeling like it was us against the world, I think was the inspiration. So this is gonna be real. I'm taking you to the booger, booger, booger basement where everyone started it. That booger basement had a lot of great, talented people, you know, and later on, you know, to me it was the, the booger basement was the Motown around that time, you know what I'm saying? Me and Rennell and Clef would be like, okay, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? They just cut the electricity, there's a session coming, you know, or they cut the water. You know, we have no water. This is where we all, everyone used to be here. From Lauren Hill to Pras, Pras bedroom used to be right here in Clef. Everybody was leaving here, bro. You might even see in that garage, that's where everything, we probably probably even see some old stuff in that garage, some, some refugee stuff. Two distinct impressions. One, there's a lot of great gear here. Two, the environment is questionable for a lot of this great gear. Meaning, what? There weren't necessarily security measures in place for all this great gear. You didn't see cameras around. It's good to have dogs and people would just come in, um, but we had black and we had alpha. We had one dog named alpha and we had black. Black was no joke. Black was black. You know what I mean? And nobody, you come here, you come in the wrong way, black will eat you alive. So people used to be like, you come here, yo, everybody used to chill, because we, once we let black out, you know. I went out to the Booger Basement, um, played a, a bunch of tracks that nobody pretty much knew that I was working on. And um, we were in the Booger Basement, it was like 30, 40 Haitians, tight, packed, so you couldn't even move around. It wasn't even like a luxurious big studio. It was, you know, it was a studio that was, that, 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 that was heartfelt and, 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 and earnest. And by that, I mean small. And involved, and uh, and, I, and I played these tracks, and I just knew I, I I knew I had it because I'd look around and I just I'd see heads not you know it wasn't it wasn't really crazy people weren't going crazy but I just okay I got them I got them if you're in this house you had to eat Haitian food so my mom would just cook for everyone I'm talking about from Bono that been to this house you know this house everyone really we did a score we used to have a big gate. So nobody could come here. Even you come in the house, you couldn't get in. You had to walk down these little stairs, and there would be a gate that actually would lock after everybody was left. So it was almost like you're walking into a jail cell. This is the gate. That I get to today, it's not even easy to take off. And you go down there, and it's a whole bunch of equipment, like a big-ass board in a small-ass room. The board took up that whole space, so half the room was already gone. The S9, we had all the Juno 106. We had all of them line up, all the equipment. Line up. We had the outboard gear on this side, and we didn't have that much room. But this room, we have 20 people, and why we, you know, why we going in? I mean, I would go, in, I would go into the booth, and I, I, I I'd, I'd do a verse, and immediately, I mean, you would know. If you came out of the booth, and, and and everybody was sweating from your energy, then all right, well, maybe you had a take. But I tell you, man, if I came out of the booth and. People were like on the phone or drinking Kool-Aid or, or, or playing checkers and I knew I didn't do my job. So it, it, my job was to make sure that people paid attention to me when it was my turn to be paid attention to. And it was just a lot of energy. Like you would go upstairs, get, get some, you know, some air, cool off, come up with an idea, go back downstairs, lay it. But the only person that could stay in there from day to night literally was probably Jerry and Clef. I remember um, when we, the first record we recorded in the Fuji's was um, Ready or Not. You know, I was sitting here, Warren, right, um, the engineer, white boy, you know, I love Warren, long hair, tattooed out. You never know that this dude was, a, you know, like, engineer, so cool. And we'll talk, he, water came out of his eyes when Long went in that room and said, Ready or Not. I mean, because... She didn't even tell us that's what she was going to do. She just, it was me and Warren at the time. Uh, Clef wasn't there, or, or Paz, it was the two of us. Um, you know, me and Lauren, we were very connected. And musically, we always do great stuff, you know. Um, when we, that was the first song that we recorded on a, on a score. 
it was the size of a jail cell, really, with a small bathroom that was like, we literally had to bend down and walk to the Boca booth. People don't know that. This is the real Booger basement. This is where that sold, what, 30 million records? 25 to 30. <laughs> this is it. So, I mean, to get money here, we had to do, you know, do sessions. And, you know, of course, I was doing the little top 40 gigs. And uh, my brother was doing everything he could, you know, from working. And between what the studio was bringing, Wyclef was bringing, you know, we all was a part of whatever we had to do. Because nobody really was making money, you know, whatever we made. And I remember me and my brother team up. We went and bought all this equipment in Boston. We used to have all the equipment on the truck when we built a booger. Nobody knew. We had like, you know, 40 something thousand dollars, uh, $70,000 worth of equipment outside on a U-Haul while we built up the basement. My name is Vanel Duplessis. I mean, they used to call me the Godfather because I was the one, you know, behind financing the whole thing. You know, working two, three jobs as a, ch as a chef. <laughs> you know, while Jerry and Clef were working here, you know, myself, I, all I do look for equipment. We closed this. This was open. That's when we closed this and make it a warm. So this way, Clef, and Lauren, we had like an MPC in there. They have, we, we do a little setup. Everybody had a little setup in their room beside the studio. This way, while session is happening, Jerry would be sitting there with his headphone making things happen. But the way it is, it wasn't like the perfect basement. So we were talking, talking, then prize all of us we were, we were coming up and like, yo, man, that's like a booger. <laughs> then we're like, Wait a minute. Yeah, that sounds good. Booger basement it is. And that's how we call it the Booger basement. That's how the name came up. Irrespective of what people thought of you or what people told you you could do or you could accomplish, you felt the cocoon-like atmosphere in the Booger basement where the rest of the world didn't matter because we were going to turn whatever we were going to transform those beats and those rhymes and those lyrics and those melodies and harmonies into, we were going to change that into something beautiful for our own, for our own appreciation. Um, and, 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 and they were, they were very motivational in, in, in that, in that spirit, in that camaraderie, in that coming togetherness. And that's what, and that's what I, I, I remember about that time. And that's what I respect about, about, uh, about their energy. The Booger Basement, to sum up the question, was very small, but full of a lot of energy. Well, for me, when I, when I created the beef for Fujila, like I really, I literally made it for Fat Joe. Chris Slighty and Fat Joe had come to my house. I was living like right across from the Def Jam building on 50th Street at the time. He's like, yo, Fat Joe's like, yo, I like that beat you did for the Fuji. He's like, hey, 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 give me a beat like that. And then I made Fuji La, that track, and I'm probably in that track and another track. And he came back later that week. I was like, yo, what you think? He was like, I can't tell. This is kind of different. You know, I'm not sure if that's really what I want to do. And he wasn't really into it because it was kind of eclectic. And then I remember saying it to Clef at one point, oh, if you like this beat, you should try a verse on it like this. And Clef was like, what, you rap too? Nah, 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 you gotta be on this. And that was, that was Cowboys. And it was, it was Cowboys and I, I anchored that and then family business and, and then other stuff happened just being around, remixing Killing Me Softly, uh, um, co-producing No Woman No Cry with, uh, with, with, with Clef and, and doing those drums on there, which I, which I can still hear and remember. At, 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 um, it's just old school. It's just banging on the table, you know. But it but it comes from um, it comes from a sincere place. It was a beat that I made for Fat Joe, that Lauren kept saying, "Yo, play the Fat Joe beat." You know, this is cool. But let's play the Fat Joe beat. And during that session, I played the beat, and Wyclef jumps up and says, "We used to be number ten. Pretty much spit his whole first verse. So during that week, we was like, you know what? While we're here, let's just vibe. And you know, I had a studio in Midtown, so it was like they just kept coming through. And then Lauren started singing different things that could be the chorus. She sang a bunch of different soul records, but then when she hit on Ooh La La La, that was the one that locked it in, that made the beat feel like, yeah. So she'd actually done it on somebody else's record at the time, like it's just a part of her verse.
But then she was like, yo, what I'm going to do? So they was like, yo, call them and tell them we changed the part on that record because this is going to be our hook on this record. The creative side of this album came from just break beats, inspirations from all over. You know, we was always into great music and different types of music. We listened to everything. Heavily influenced by reggae, heavily influenced by calypso, heavily influenced by just African rhythms, Haitian rhythms. Um, hip hop, of course, was like the cornerstone of what we was listening to at the time. And it kind of reflected, you know, with the lifestyle that we were dealing with at that moment. So when you listen to even some of the lyrics, they would jump from religion all the way back down to something that was just irrelevant. Well, the Enya sample, when, we, um, when it was, um, I didn't know we, we had to really clear that sample, because that was the time it was just starting, like, if you sample something, you have to clear it. A lot of people, you know, a lot of, you know, you have Tribe Called Quest later on, and everybody got sued, everybody, Karis One got sued. A lot of people got sued in a producer's band because we didn't know what that means. We had to go clear sample. With the Anya, since we did it, remember the name of the album was The Score. So the score, the, op, the song was going to the next song. Anytime it layers, since we never stopped, the album, you, if you listen to the album, will you let it run, it run just like the score. It's just fading into to the next song. When you were trying to clear one song, the one loop was in the other songs of the county, more 110%, 125%. When I listen back to the score, I remember hearing, hearing all these tracks, and there was one track. It was the last track that I heard and it was killing me softly. He's drumming my pain with his fingers. That was a surprise to me, to be honest with you. I knew that L had an, an affinity for it. I knew we played around, but I didn't know that it was actually going to get done until I showed up and they played it for me. And I guess the funniest part of it is that Lauren was always saying, hey, you know, when I do my solo song on the album, I want you to produce it, but I'd already done my two songs for the album. So one day I get a call from Proz. Like, hey man, I'm like what's up? Yo, if you were gonna produce uh you know something, killing me softly and then so like how how would you do it? Like what would you think about it? And I was like, um, I I'd probably kinda do it like like beneath the apple bomb a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yo, yeah, yeah. this is now. why Clef refuge. And I was like, yeah, probably in that zone, because you know, of course I know all the original samples. And I was thinking, just you know, I'll use the little feet drums to whatever. So, oh, that's the same thing I was thinking. I'll call you right back. Click. <laughs> it probably took him a good 10 years to admit that that phone call ever happened. But, um, so I go, such is life. All these uh, Booger Basement reels, and of course, later on, you probably see uh, this uh, stuff I did on John Forte. There's a stuff that I did, uh, what is it, uh, CD High stuff in here. This whole heavy tape could be in one little flash drive, one gig flash drive will have this big thing and probably four or five of them. So the whole time when we break sound as hip hop producers, we don't be really having a live drummer in the room because we don't never have a, the studio never that big, this big to get a drummer to come in. So we go out and buy vinyl, see what we got here. There we go. And then play and let's see what's going. Nothing but bricks. And that's where that's where that's where we used to get we used to just go ahead and get and get um and just chop up to quit the drum. You know the whole thing if I want just this now, you know, if I just want the cake, if I just want the cake, and then, this is this is the SP twelve hundred. This is what we do, right? Here. That's what we use for the drum machine. That's the whole concept, and that's what this whole this whole album is about. But I took my mom to the Grammys that year. Dominique Dawes, who was a, a world-class gymnast, was on my right side. We weren't together. But it was just letting you know. Like, I mean, we were like three rows from the back. Sting said my name during the whole thing. It was amazing. So when I went back to Brooklyn, you couldn't tell me anything. I'm, I, what? I was like, I felt like Big Daddy Kane. I felt like, I felt like GPS. You have arrived. I was 
happy that whatever things I was able to do between Nappy Heads, Vocab Remix, and Fujila helped inform them of their sound. And then once again, they took the initiative to really work hard and do what they had to do with their album. And for me, that's the whole process of being a producer and also a mentor. It all came and stemmed from the root of what was created in the Booger basement with the refugee camp. So this album that I'm holding is, 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 a, is, is, is historical for me because this was the beginning of who I am today and what incorporated what I'm doing even in the lifestyle of when I write, when I produce, you know, what inspires me all came from the experiences that came from the making of this album right here. This score always the number one record for me. Always would be. It doesn't matter what I produce. What I produce, great record, you know, Hibs Don't Lie, Shakira, Carlos Santana Moria, White Club 911, and I did all the sweetest thing, you know, with, 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 with um, Lauren on that, beside the Fugees and uh, Ghetto Superstar and Praz, and, and I could go to Justin Bieber, the Trace songs, and everything I was, I've done in my life. Um, there's nothing could replace this album for me. And I love it. The day it will, I'll stop. So I'll be like, oh, I beat, I beat, no. This album is very, every song in this album means something very important to me uh, of, um, as a man, as a human being, you know what I'm saying? So that's what this, this album means to me. And that's, that's what put me on. Don't ever forget where you're from. And when you, when you hear it, when it manifests, when it becomes more than just a dream or a hunch, and it becomes real and actualized, it's a game changer. I mean, how did it, how did it feel to me to listen back and, and hear some of the most talented people that I would ever meet grace my music and then have the opportunity to play in that arena with them? It was and remains a great blessing. This is, this is the, the album that I always play in the house for you guys. Um. Yeah, that's the Fuji's. <laughs> you know, me, I claimed, I claimed Trinidad, and they claimed Haiti, and we, we had links in Jamaica. You know, I said on, on Stayin' Alive, I'm eating mangoes in Trinidad with attorneys. <laughs> We almost have to take a quick pause. Yeah, you rolled it. Yeah. We were gonna end it. He was gonna be like, "So you uh, still eat mangoes?" <laughs> 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 something like he didn't say anything about eating mangoes in Trinidad. He's clearly a man who's adjusted himself to the times. Right. Oh lord.